shaded area, which looks so very nice. Uh, really looks good. Uh, Dr. Golder, could we have the roll call, please? Yes, Dr. Powers. Here. Ms. Scott. Here. Mrs. Wise. Mr. Irwin. Here. Mrs. Killian. Here. Mrs. Lohr. Here. Ms. Lauer. Here. Thank you. If you will join me in the play. Our vision is working together with our community. We inspire our students to discover their talents and rise to their greatest potential. Our mission is building on the strengths of our diverse community. We create an engaging, comprehensive, educational environment that supports the growth of lifelong learners. I think now we're going to hear from Mr. Dr. Mr. Dr. Balachevich. <laughs> so you remember that TV show to tell the truth? That's what this kind of feels like. Well, yeah. Yeah. Dr. Balachevich, please. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, well, good evening, Dr. Hayward. President Lauer, members of the School Board of Trustees, I want to give you an update on uh, COVID-19 within the uh, Union County School Corporation. I guess I need this too. So uh, I wanted to give you an update on COVID-19 and I'll entertain any questions during or after my presentation. Uh, as of now, in our school corporation, uh, uh, within the uh, Vigo County, uh, in general, we have four new cases today, and our daily new cases per 100,000 is nine, uh, which is, uh, the, we had eight, it was at eight last week, it's at nine now, it's under double digits, which is the lowest it's been uh, probably since last summer. Uh, 56 cases per 100,000, which puts us in the blue category. We've been blue now for four weeks. And the positivity rate, seven-day positivity rate, is 2.6%. Hospitalizations are at 11. They're up uh, a tad bit. And um, right now we have four active uh, positive students, 10, or 10 active positive students, four active staff members, positive staff members for a total of 14. And within that, we have three elementary, four middle school and three high school students that are currently positive, and two teachers, one EA, one cafeteria worker uh, that are positive. Just some highlights here. We've, uh, so when I was with you last time on March 22nd, we had five positive staff cases. Currently, we have four. And we have four positive student cases. Currently, we have 10. We've been looking at numbers and keeping some data since January the 4th. Dr. Brecken asked us to look at data, uh, specific data about individuals that have been quarantined <coughs> within the school to see if that they became positive. Uh, so, for example, if I was positive uh, and uh, there were students uh, that were around me or individuals that were around me that we had to quarantine, did they become positive? The answer is no. We have had no positive students from a quarantine uh, since January the 4th. We've been keeping those statistics since then. Um, We've had a few cases from extracurricular and co-curricular activities, but nothing significant. 
uh, like, it be, like it's being recorded by the CDC. Adult to adult spread, according to the CDC, is probably the biggest area of concern in the school. We've seen very little of that. According to the CDC, surface transmission is of very low significance. They've been coming out with studies of that. Uh, the fomite transmission, transmission, as they would call it, is uh, very low incidences of that. So they've, ch they've changed our guidance with uh, sanitation. We have not changed ours. Uh, we are still following uh, the protocols that we set forth at the beginning of the year. Our cases have increased slightly. Hospitalizations have increased slightly. Positivity rate has inched up. Vaccinations, according to local officials, have been widely available, and they, are, they have open appointments, uh, wide, widely open appointments out there. And uh, currently, and I just spoke with the health department this afternoon with uh, Mrs. Miller, uh, we are investigating the possibility of having vaccination clinics at the high school for students 16 and up. We're working with the health department and Mrs. Wise with that. So we are investigating that, and, and hopefully we can, we can do that at our high schools. I know that the health department can, we just have to look to uh, the uh, procedure within our own school. And lastly, I talked with Dr. Brucken and Dr. Holder today, and they are both cautiously optimistic uh, and continue to monitor the situation as we go through it. So at this time, I'll entertain any questions. Thank you. That, I like all the details there. Big things looking positive. <laughs> <laughs> so now. But anyway, it sounds good. Are there any questions from the board or comments? Yeah. Uh, I'll just ask is there any reason, in your professional opinion, why we would not go back to school five days a week before the school year is out? In my professional opinion, at this point in time, uh, I would say uh, with conditions that we have now, that I think that would be well, well be in order. Uh, let's continue to look at the situation, but at this point in time, all indications point to that uh, we're in a better spot than we were probably a few weeks ago in many regards. Thank you. But we have to be cautious, and I just want to say that. That's very, very important to say, that we're very cautious about what we do. We're closely watching um, to see what if there's any residual effects from spring break. And we discussed that this morning in our 10 o'clock briefing that uh, we really think that if we haven't seen an uptick by next Friday, we should be out of the woods. And then we're also keeping a close eye on what's happening in Michigan and the different variants. But, but it's looking good for our county, the way we're trending. Great. Oh, well, no, I just said, I just said great. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I was just curious, um, how is the, with, with the few that you do have out, are you doing okay with subs or is there still Problem. Well, I, right now I think we're okay in, in that department. I, Mr. Riley sends out that dashboard every Tuesday morning, so he'll be doing that tomorrow. <clears throat> I don't have any indications at this time that we're, we're experiencing an issue. There was one school that we had a little bit of concern with, but I haven't heard from that school now for a couple days, so I assume that we're probably okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank on to school consolidation update, Dr. Fenton. Good evening. Wanted to give you just kind of an update of some things that have been going on since our last conversation. We've been able to have a few field trips for our boys and girls that will be attending new schools. Um, those are the only field trips that we've been having, and but we thought it was really important for boys and girls to be able to get into their new schools so that they could start feeling a little bit more comfortable with that. As you can see in a couple of the pictures here, uh, Dr. Seuss's birthday took place, and they were able to participate in a um, parade around the school and kind of felt part of that group in regards to that. At Sugar Creek Consolidated, the boys and girls came in and they got new t-shirts so that they kind of got the the school swag so they felt like they were part of that group and had their pictures taken and felt very welcome in those situations. We've had uh, school counselors that have been going to um, both 
their home school and their new school and making sure that they're getting to, to uh, know the, the personnel. They've read the classes. I know the counselors are going every Friday now and continue to do that through the end of the school year. So they have that familiar face. The principals have been made uh, several visits as well. Um, in that center picture, as you can see, they had a scavenger hunt at a couple of the schools where they were able to kind of take this uh, paper and go around the building to find things and uh, just to feel a bit more comfortable and meet different people in the building. Um, but overall, they've done a lot of uh, fun kind of activities. Uh, they've come back to their home school and been excited about it. We've had a parent night. Several of the schools are planning an outdoor event uh, probably in May to um, kind of get parents comfortable in the new schools. The other thing that we're doing is we're making sure we're celebrating West Vigo and Deming Elementary Schools for the fine schools that they've been for a number of years. Uh, we'll, we'll be working with the Educational Heritage Museum and those ladies that will be helping us to preserve um, those schools as well. So lots of activities going on and kids are having fun and just exciting right now for those changes. We also um, have uh, reinitiated our uh, school consolidation committee, knowing that we have another task ahead of us to make another recommendation to the board. And we will be meeting in May to start that process again. We'll work over the summer and be ready to bring back any recommendations that we may come up with uh, probably next fall. I'm happy to answer any questions about school consolidation. I'm pleased and not surprised by all the activities of making the students feel comfortable in their, in their to be new school. Um, it's great to have all the creativity and uh, just getting them involved and, and everything. That's good. They've been really excited about the facilities as well, which is kind of one of the reasons we're looking at those schools for closure was the facilities uh, needed some work. They were excited for the stairs that consolidated. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so particularly at consolidated, uh -huh. there's the grandfathering rule. Yes. Um, has that had much of an effect on the numbers um, that a, were a presented bit. to us mm -hmm. um, on class sizes and things like that? Class sizes still are in check. In fact, I just had uh, reports turned into me last Friday in regards to anticipated enrollment, and they're balancing that well. We may need to have a class here or there in order to. to balance that out, but class sizes will be right in check with the other buildings. And there will be plenty of classroom space, yep. spaces yep. for we are good. kitchen cabinet space. Yeah. Uh, at Consolidate, we're actually um, um, taking down the um, computer labs because of the Chromebooks that we have in place, so that's provided us another space. And the staff is Staffing, we have <coughs> two people that have selected a new home, right. and they've been invited to attend faculty meetings. They've gone for some social events um, and work closely with the principals as well. So I think they're starting to feel comfortable there as well. That's good. And I know the Educational Heritage Association is housed at McLean and um, will um, aptly use and welcome all the artifacts yep. from the schools that are closing and yeah that will be uh, good i hope and i hope that's good um advertisement for them for people to go see all that they have from all the schools that have ever been in Duke county so they do a phenomenal job yes they work hard got a question i was just about the committee that is reforming yeah. is it did, did you say previously that there's turnover in that or is it the same group that worked previously? there's a little bit of turnover because i asked who would like to remain on the committee a few of the, the people that maybe were associated with west Vigo or deming mm -hmm. have opted to take come off the committee a couple of them wanted to stay though because they've got the history and they have to understand the process so they are staying but then we looked at the schools that were going to be looking um, to look a little deeper in and make sure we have representation from each one of those buildings on the committee as well. How many people? Are um, I think it's 22 right now. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments from the board members? Okay, I think uh, Dr. Fenton, you're going to go ahead with the curriculum and instruction. Yeah, they gave me the mic and I won't let go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
So um, I'm going to kind of start off the curriculum instruction piece. Yeah, in, in talking about that, we think about Vigo County School Corporation being a K-12 system. And what people don't really realize is we are a lot more than K-12. Uh, we actually start with very, very young learners. And just to give you a little bit of history, uh, used to be that kindergarten programming was a half-day program. And every child that went to a kindergarten program attended half day. And of course, it was inconvenient for families, and particularly working families. But um, we saw a need to offer a full day program. And so back um, in the 1990s, we actually used Title I funding, which is a federal grant, in order to provide an opportunity for students at Warren Elementary School to go full day. And what we found was those boys and girls had not had opportunity to have programming. Mm -hmm. And by offering that to them, we saw a great um, increase in their abilities when they entered uh, first grade. So as the years kind of rolled by, year after year, at the Title I schools, we actually added more full day kindergarten programming, noticing that great strides were being made in regards to the testing that we did and just the socialization of boys and girls too. So year after year, we added another full day kindergarten program. And uh, by the, the 2000s, we had full day kindergarten programs in every single one of our Title I buildings. However, those non-title buildings still were going half day programs. They didn't have any option. It was always a half day program. Uh, in 2011, the state decided to fully fund kindergarten. And at that time, we offered full day kindergarten program in all of our elementary schools, all 18. But that also freed up some Title I funding to utilize for early education. And so at that point, we looked at what can we do to make sure that our early, early learners are um, you know, getting an advantage. So we turned our attention to early education and pre-K. And in 2009, we actually started some programming. There's a lot of studies out there that show that uh, boys and girls who have an opportunity for early childhood do, do well later on in life. Um, they close those achievement gaps, particularly in high poverty situations. And it's a wise financial investment because when you retain a child, you're actually adding an additional year of education at a cost of over $9,000, $9,500. That's kind of a number that's getting out there. So at the bottom of that slide, you can see up the number 253. In one school year, actually two years ago, we retained 253 students. And so that's a cost to our corporation. Had we invested that money up front and not had the retentions, the cost is much less. And so we really started to look at what can we do to make early childhood a priority. So we developed a committee, we got together, we had kindergarten teachers, we had early childhood teachers, we had principals, we had parents that all got together and said, wouldn't it be nice if? And we just thought of, what's this wonderful thing that we could do for the boys and girls in Vigo County? And we thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a center where all kids could go and have early education? Uh, yeah, we'll never get there, but. And so what we started to do then was look at what we could do to start it off. So in 2009, we got some additional funding for Deming Elementary School, in which we thought, what's the best investment we could make at Deming Elementary? And we started a pre-K program. And at that particular time, I think we had 14 students and um, invested those funds in that. And we started looking at shifting that kindergarten money then to pre-K programs instead of kindergarten programs. So pre-K is that four-year-old age level. And last year, we were able to support 13 sites with 26 pre-K programs because they were half-day programs. We're back to the half-day stuff again. <laughs> um, but they're all staffed with early childhood teachers. So this is kind of what our history has been doing. Again, in 2009, we started that first program at Deming. And then each year after, as we saw the benefits of it, we started adding those programs. And you could see how um, those added up year after year, the number of students that we are 
influencing. In 2019-20, you can see we had 426 students. That sounds like a lot of boys and girls that we're reaching, but if you think about a typical kindergarten class being 1,200 students, we're missing a lot of kids. Now, we don't have to provide that programming to everybody, but we want to make sure it's happening somewhere, and it wasn't happening for our boys and girls. Last year was kind of an, a unique year, or this year, 2021. We only had 132 students involved because I think we had a lot of parents that were a little cautious about sending boys and girls to school. So this is kind of a, an unusual year, but like I said, last year was 426 students that we reached. The other part of the vision that we had for our early childhood programs was to make sure that we were doing training and providing workshops. And so uh, we offered uh, teachers in those early childhood programs opportunity to get together and talk together because most of them were kind of on an island by themselves. You had you know, classroom, you may have two second grade classrooms, you have four third grade classrooms, but you had one preschool teacher in the building that just was by <coughs> itself. So we kind of pulled them together to make sure that they had opportunity to learn from one another. And we started then in uh, 2011 uh, providing those training because 2011, again, was the year that full day kindergarten was funded by the state and we were able to shift that money. Well, we just want to, don't want to say, yeah, we think it's doing a good job. We really think that pre-K is important, but we just have this gut feeling that wasn't enough. We wanted to prove that it was making a difference. And so we looked at double test every year in kindergarten. When they first came in the, in the uh, kindergarten program, we do this devil's test. And we were able to take a look at that data to see whether or not it was making a difference. And this is just an example of um, the tracking that we did. The orange bar is showing those boys and girls who um, are in the program, a preschool program. The red bar was those boys and girls that um, had the preschool program, or excuse me, the orange bar was the ones that had the preschool program and the orange then was the ones that did not, and the difference that it made. And so in most of those cases, anywhere between a seven and 19% difference between those who had preschool and those who did not have preschool, that was the difference in their scores. And if you think about a seven to 19% increase based on one program, that's pretty phenomenal. The other thing we looked at was not just our preschool programs we looked at, we looked at if they had attended any preschool program in our community because we have a lot of really strong programs uh, in regards to that. The United Way of the Wabash Valley has started uh, collecting data as well in regards to kindergarten programming, not just Vigo County, but the surrounding counties so that we can show that the difference that's being made there. So we have this preschool thing going on over here and this kindergarten thing happening over here, but we also had some daycare that were happening. Likes and Tykes has been a, a daycare program that's taken place at the West Vigo High School for 20 years now. So they were very groundbreaking in what they had done. Uh, basically, it was an opportunity for our high school students to have a place to go to learn about being teachers and being early childhood teachers. And so we wanted to duplicate that when we saw the good things that was happening with that. We also wanted to have a benefit for our employees, because I remember as a young mother, I had trouble finding daycare for my children so that I could work as a teacher. And then if you didn't have daycare, you had to find a daycare program that you probably paid for the whole summer in order to save your spot, or you had to pay for holidays and vacations. So we wanted to cater to our employees. And over the several year programming, we actually now have four daycare programs that are going on. We have Little Braves, which is at South High School, Little Lions, that is at Lost Creek, Little Racers is out at Riley's, and Bikes and Tikes remains at uh, West Vigo. So it is open to any child of the Vigo County School Corporation employee, so that's of any employee whatsoever. They run for the academic year, coincides with our calendar. We offer payroll deduction to our um, employees, and it's still we are offering the high school students an opportunity to come into those programs then, so it's not just happening at West Vigo, it's now happening south and north so they can get into our programs and, and learn how to uh, take those developmental classes. 
And then it started to get a little big. So I've got the kindergarten and the preschool and the daycares going here, and I'm pulling my hair out, and I think, I need help. <laughs> and voila, <laughs> Ashley Bennett has been a godsend. We hired her in 2017 as an early childhood administrator. And I'll give you a little hint that you will probably get a recommendation pretty soon from me to make sure she's named as the principal at the Beginning Learning Center. But that's to come. <laughs> um, so we've got, uh, in 2018-19, when she came on board, we actually opened up those daycare programs that were just serving three and four-year-olds. We opened it up to every age level. So we actually have, what, six weeks old is the youngest that we take. And the other part of that was we are offering daycare to our pregnant and parenting teens that are on the south side of the, of the community so that they have a place to send their boys and girls so that they can continue their education in high school. And so we've got all these little pieces happening all over the place, but we're helping young learners. So this kind of gives you an idea of how this has expanded in our daycare program. 2014, we were, had 43 students that we were have, uh, servicing, and 67 high school students were benefiting from these programs. And as you can see, year after year, we've expanded. We got up to 105 in 1920, and then, of course, COVID happened, and that's dropped down a little bit. So again, that's just a little bit of a, a blip in our radar, but we are looking for expansions. The other thing that happens with the daycare is we may want to make sure we have high quality daycares. And so Mrs. Bennett's going to share just a little bit about what that entails. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about pass to quality. So that's the Indiana State rating system for high quality child cares. Um, it's a one to four rating system. One meaning you're just a licensed facility and four meaning you're accredited by a local body. Um, we uh, use three and four mean high quality child care. So if, if you would call the Casey office, for example, looking for child care for your, for your student, um, they would recommend all three and four levels. We are currently a level three at all of our sites. Um, that along with that goes the on my way pre-K grant. So we got the on my, on my way pre-K grant to come to Vigo County because the school corporation decided to sign on to doing Paths to Quality. They decided they would give us the funding that way, which was really exciting because Success by Six, the United Way um, committee does the match for On My Way Pre-K. So that means that any boy or girl that is four by August 1st can sign up for that grant and it will pay for their daycare and their childcare or their preschool. So um, they can get vouchers for the full amount and now limited eligibility is also offered in case they um, don't meet the qualifications but are close. That will pay a little bit of their pre-K. So it's really nice they come in and swipe a little card and that's all they have to do. Um, also with that level three, we are allowed to take CCDF vouchers which are very similar to On My Way Pre-K but those are for kids that are infant all the way to school aged. Um, so that really helps our high school students as well. If they want to bring their kiddos, we charge them a minimal amount um, just to help teach them kind of responsibility for their kiddos. But um, it also helps the program. And then once they graduate, if we get them on these CCDF vouchers, they can go on to college or on to, you know, a job and use these CCDF vouchers at that point too because they follow the child along until they're in school full time. Um, they also can use them for after school care as well. Um, next, a little bit about Paths to Quality. It is all play-based. So when we first started this program, we had consultants come in and kind of train me and our teachers on you know, what these programs should look like to be high quality. And what that means is all hands-on, all experiential learning. You will not see one worksheet in any pre-K class. Um, they will not sit down for more than five to 10 minutes at a time and they should be fully engaged all the time. So they're up singing, dancing. They're not going to sit and do a worksheet about the letter A. They're going to make the letter A in shaving cream or they're going to play in a sensory box full of letter A items or they're going to go on a scavenger hunt to find things that start with letter A. So it's not the typical sit down lecture classroom. Um, it's also, like I said, experience driven. Part of Paths to Quality means a third of your day has to be child choice. 
So instead of a traditional station uh, program like we do, we actually open 10 interest centers that hit all the general things like math, reading, science, blocks, um, anything you could think of in a kindergarten classroom, but the children get to pick which station they want to go to and for how long they want to stay there. So um, within those stations, teachers sit with them and ask them questions uh, to kind of expand their learning. So we know that they're going to, you know, maybe pick blocks because that's what they're interested in, but I can ask them lots of math questions there, or science questions, you know, how are you gonna build this tower? How many blocks do you need? What colors are you going to use to kind of expand their learning and build on their interests instead? Um, also, they're all developmentally appropriate. That's something that we're checked for. So I'm not going to ask a student to do something they're not ready for. We all know that pre-K students come in at all different levels. Um, we may have someone who has no experience with school or we may have someone starting to read. So we meet each child where they're at. Sorry, I forgot I'm clicking my own. <laughs> um, also, we ha are required to have high quality child caregivers, um, meaning 50% of my staff has to have at least 12 college credit hours or CDA in early childhood or elementary education. Um, 12 to 20 hours is required per year of all of my staff, and that's through webinars, through the state of Indiana. Sometimes we have Casey office people come in, train us, or I'll do the training if I've gone to a webinar or to a conference as well. Um, all the infant toddlers are safe sleep certified. Um, and then our lead teachers in everyday care are licensed teachers. So they're all early childhood or elementary teacher. Um, we also have yearly state visits. That's a health and safety requirement. And then we also have a secondary state visit from Paths to Quality every year. Um, the health and safety visits are unannounced. So actually those are happening anytime in the next two weeks <laughs> um, where they check and make sure we're doing what we should be doing. Um, we've never had an issue before, so we don't intend any issues in the future. <laughs> Um, also, background checks, drug testing, TB testing, and physicals are all required of our staff members. So it's just that extra check on them that even a normal teacher doesn't need. So you know that your kiddos are safe. <laughs> um, lastly, uh, On My Way Pre-K, like I said, is a great grant that we were able to get. Um, it's state funding for just four-year-olds. The CCDF is for all the kids younger than that. Um, and it is for low income families. So there is an income threshold that they have to sign up for. Um, parents must be in school or working to receive this voucher. The only uh, nice thing that they've changed for COVID times are um, they changed the service need that parents could also be searching for a job because they know a lot of parents, you know, are having trouble with that now. Um, so now that can be another service need for them. Um, and any level three and four can accept these vouchers, which is nice because then any child can attend our daycares and any child can also attend our pre-Ks. Um, with Deming Early Learning Center, previously we only had Title I pre-K students at those half-day programs, but now anyone can attend the Deming Early Learning Center for a full day of pre-K, um, and anyone can attend our daycares as well. It is not just staff. Um, we've opened that up to the public as well from infants and up. So that has been a great change to our program. So we've talked about a lot of different things going on in regards to um, our early learners. Um, and back in January, this board, uh, thank you very much, voted to turn Deming Elementary School into Deming Early Learning Center. And I want you to think back at 2009 when we started our first preschool program at Deming Elementary. And so it's really come full circus at circle and appreciate all that you've done in order to make this happen and it will be starting in the fall. Um, so everything was kind of disjointed because I've got Title I Pre-K going on over here and I've got uh, the daycares over there. And so we're gonna able to put this underneath one roof and start to consolidate this a bit. Um, again, as uh, Mrs. Bennett said, we'll be able to offer this to non-title students as well, whereas before we couldn't offer anything to our non-title families. And so these are the things that are gonna be going on at Deming Early Learning Center. As you can see, daycare starting at infant through two. We'll have the daycare preschool program, which is three and four years old. The other thing we didn't talk about was our Covered Bridge preschools. And Covered Bridge is our special education district. And so we've got several programs throughout Vigo County 
where our three and four year old um, children who have special needs get services and they are kind of scattered throughout the county in different schools and so this is an opportunity to again consolidate those programs underneath the same roof so you've got typical peers along with special needs students that are be working closely together and so again just thank you so much you think about 12 year difference between Deming Elementary School one preschool program and coming this far to have an early learning center that was the vision of that, that uh, committee that was formed. The other thing that's going to happen at Deming Elementary is going to be um, the transitional kindergarten and transitional kindergarten will be brand new next year. We have a lot of parents that say I'm not ready to send my kinder my five-year-old to a kindergarten program. They're just not ready for school yet. This is an opportunity for them to send their child to a transitional kindergarten program. They would go through this program, which is more play-based, and then they could send them on to kindergarten the following year. And so they actually would be able to get two years of kindergarten rather than just keeping them home. And then we also have those boys and girls that um, are uh, special needs but don't qualify for more intensive programs. This is another opportunity for those boys and girls to be in a transitional program as well. So they would be able to be qualified for two years of kindergarten, but if they are ready to go on, we would move them on to a first grade program. The other thing that Mr. Dillian is going to talk about a little bit later on is the adult education program. We're actually going to offer some adult education programs there at the Deming site for child care, child development, those kinds of things, so that those parents that are asking for CCDF vouchers that either have to be working or in school now have an opportunity to be in school by taking one of our classes right there to help them um, be better parents for their children. A lot's going to be happening. I'm excited to have you come visit us there next year. So we have a lot of partnerships that are going into this. So um, uh, ISU has been working closely with us. They have an early learning program there and uh, is going to be placing some of their students in our program at Deming. St. Mary of the Woods is going to be working with us closely. United Way of the Wabash Valley, as I said, has been doing some research and some support and some funding for us uh, to get some things started. Casey works very closely with Mrs. Bennett in regards to the licensing piece of that. And the other thing that we want to make sure happens is that our local daycares are involved with us as well. We don't want to take over the daycare business. We have some great daycares in our community. But what we're finding is we don't have enough daycares in our, in our community. Again, go back to that number of 1,200 kindergartners that are going to enroll for next year, and only 400 and some were able to attend a pre-K program. And so this is an opportunity for all students and all parents who want their children to have a preschool opportunity to be able to have one because we have early learning going on at Denny Elementary. The Family Y also will be a, a program that's going to work with us in regards to after school daycare. So um, a lot happening there. Uh, with the kindergarten programs there, we'll get funding for that in regards to just the regular kindergarten grant through the, the uh, general education. So um, looking at, we're closing the building, but how are you saving any money if you have so much going on in there? And so the way that's going to happen is we're not going to be using the general fund like it's being used right now at, as it being an elementary school. We'll be able to use those Title I funds in order to offset costs for teacher salaries. We'll be able to use special education funding in order to offset costs for those teachers as well. We have the parent pay option so that we have our employees that are paying to attend. Those that qualify for CCDF funding or on my way pre-K, that funding comes straight from the state to us. Then the kindergarten money is the basic state grant that comes to us. And then the other thing that uh, Mrs. Bennett is phenomenal at is looking for money and looking for grants. <laughs> and so she'll continue to do that to bring funding into that. So the idea is we want this to be a self-sustaining program. We don't want any of this hitting the general fund. Are we there yet? No. But we will be. And we're going to do that with her leadership in regards to that. So we are happy to answer any questions you might have about early learning. was information overload. <laughs> I appreciated it. I do have one question, and that, uh, what's the ratio of, of staff and lead teacher to uh, children? You can rattle that off. Okay. So that I can. <laughs> it's really dependent on the age group. So four-year-olds, it's one to 12. Three is one to 10. 
Uh, Two-year-olds is one to five, toddlers are one to five, and infants are one to four. And that's all with a lead teacher, certified lead teacher. Correct. Yes, everyone has a certified lead teacher. I have a question. You had a slide a few back about students in daycare with the years and children and high school students listed, and you said something like the high school students benefiting. Does that mean that their children are in the daycare or that they are there to do training for um, child care jobs? They're there to do training so they can get their CDA through that program. Um, so they do their practicum hours in the program and then they can come out of high school with a CDA, which means, honestly, we've had a lot go through and then come back and work for us too mm -hmm. while they're in college. Okay. Um, either they want to stay with the CDA and work for us or I have a million EAs that are getting their degrees to be teachers. So when I lose EAs, thankfully, it's usually to be a teacher anyways, but it's kind of bittersweet. So grow your own pipeline. It right? is, yeah. it is, it's kind of nice. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else on early childhood? I have a question. Um, as far as supplies, um, diapers, formula, things like that with the infants, uh, and the other children, snacks, lunch, so the, di the diapers, diapers need to come from the parents, mm -hmm. and then we actually use our food service program in order to provide the meals. Yeah. Do, so do they, they bring their own formula, or they bring their own breast milk? Yes. Yeah, so you know, if somebody did want to bring breast milk in, we have refrigerators and mm -hmm. we do the pump in. So. Yep, we have refrigerators everywhere, and we have a breastfeeding room. Um, and we have the high school students and the teachers that are at that building will come back. Sometimes we have a specific room for them, and the high school students can feed their children too. Wonderful. So that's just one little corner of our world, and we're, we're here to talk about K-12 education, and we haven't done that yet. And so I'm just going to give you kind of a quick, quick, uh, brief overview. Okay. Uh, so. Under, uh, Dr. Mason's not here today, so she's kind of my counterpart at the secondary level. And so you can kind of see by this um, slide uh, that we have elementary and secondary. I cover pre-K, so now off actually infants, through fifth grade. And then she uh, oversees the middle school and high school programs. And we have several people in program that are under our um, areas. Um, I have um, a curriculum coordinator that works with me with grants, which is generally the Title I grant. I have 18 elementary schools, so I have 18 elementary principals that report to me, and I actually do um, their evaluations and do the support for them. Um, of course, uh, Mrs. Bennett is in the Early Childhood Program, and I also oversee the Title I reading teachers in the programming through, through Title I. Dr. Mason, on the other hand, uh, works with nine secondary principals, that's the middle and the high school, and Mr. Dillian, who's in the CTE program, Career and Technical Education, and the Adult Ed, and Mrs. McDonald, who oversees, um, she's an assistant curriculum under Mr. Dillian, he'll share a little bit of information about that. So my kids always used to say, but mom, what do you do? And a lot of times I couldn't tell them. I just was busy all day long answering questions and helping people. Um, so both uh, Dr. Mason and I report directly to the superintendent. We sit in on weekly administrative team meetings. We work with other, other directors in order to uh, help the building principals and get the needs of the buildings taken care of. And then we also have monthly meetings with those administrators, with those principals, so that we can assist them and do training with them as well. The Vigo Virtual Success Academy is new the last two years, and so in regards to that, we work closely with that program as that's developing and becoming a very strong, strong virtual program. We also are liaisons between central office and uh, those principals and try to help them in any way we, that we can. And so here again, you can kind of see it's elementary range. I've got the early learning programs, daycares, pre-K, Title I uh, elementary schools, uh, Title I uh, actually services <laughs> actually services 13 elementary schools at one middle school, and um, so I oversee those programs. Dr. Mason in the secondary area uh, oversees and helps with the CTE program along with Mr. Dillian, 
and then is overseeing the um, middle and high school athletic programs. And so she works very closely with them. So we just wanted to kind of get an in-depth look at one of the things that we do, which was that early learning program, because that's the newest. And I really want to thank you and tell you how much I appreciate uh, you moving forward with that Deming Early Learning Center so that we can do the best for our boys and girls in Vigo County and get them on the right track as they get our kindergarten programs. Any other questions about elementary and secondary itself? Thank you. Good evening. The curriculum and instruction team appreciates very much the opportunity to share uh, information with you this evening. The curriculum and instruction team provides leadership and support to principals, teachers, and other staff with the overall goal of improving student learning. As you can see here, we have a picture of our team. You see our curriculum coordinators with our um, social emotional flavor up here in our t-shirts as we were working on a Reading Wonders uh, professional development. Uh, that is Holly Pease, John Newport, Caitlin Lieberman, and Janet Rosemer, our curriculum coordinators. Uh, to the, the side of them, you'll see our administrative assistants that work with us and are just tremendous, Tony Lynch, Janie Cundiff, and Debbie McIntosh. You see our district reading and writing coach, uh, Mrs. Jean McCleary, and our district math coach, Mr. Frank Bailey. Our math coaches are Everyday Math Liaisons, Kathy McKee, Diana Allen, and Dee Gosnell. Our district intervention coach that works with Holly in our 21st Century program, this is Kathy Deal. And then our writing coaches that go into our classroom and provide a collab professional development with our teachers, Sarah Fries, Melissa Sawyer, Shelly Gardner, Patty Curley, and Sandy Self. This next slide shows the alignment of our coordinators and our coaches, the content areas and the programs they serve the schools and our students. You see across that uh, first level, the curriculum coordinators and the areas of adoption that they are responsible for. And then right below those, you see the uh, coaches and the teacher leaders in terms of the instruction that they provide both during and outside the school day. We'd like to focus on our curriculum work schedule as we uh, spend some time with you this evening. This slide provides a visual of our six-year cycle that we use in the adoption process. And we have a more delineated task list as well that goes with these, uh, but you can see in that first column a little bit in the 2021 school year, what takes place during each year. And you see over there on the left, we are now in the middle of social studies curriculum adoption. And this is really important that we work through this process that we have in place. Our parents want us to be accountable for their textbook dollars that they're paying every year. And by working through a process like this, we can ensure that we have consistency across the district and that we're being cost conscious with taxpayer uh, funds. So curriculum adoption going on now in social studies, just as an example above that, last year we had language arts and world languages in Janet Rosemer's area. This year we're in the midst of implementation in that area. That means that training is going on in this area. We're working with teachers in terms of their digital platform, in terms of the components of their program, as they roll out uh, the programs this year. The prior year, uh, continuing up, we had reading and handwriting adoption that was in K-5. to And so this year, we're looking more at what kind of supplemental materials are needed in K-5. to We've purchased some math home links, as an example. We've also purchased some reading materials that have been very helpful during the pandemic. As an example,
example of continuing with an example in social studies. What are some of the major areas that Mrs. Pease is working with this year with our teachers? We have a textbook committee of teachers, our VCTA teachers that are working with us uh, throughout the year that provides consistency for us across the district and again helps us purchase at scale. Also, we have a textbook and supplementary materials caravan that takes place each year. This is provided by a um, service center across the state of Indiana and it avails our teachers as well as a parent group the ability to come to look at all the products that are being proposed across the state and to really sit down and talk about these products and what they mean for our students. This year we were not able to have an in-person caravan, we had a digital caravan, but in the past we've had in-person caravans, the last one was at the landing, and I'm remembering a luncheon that we had there with teachers and principals and parents, and it was just really nice to hear from parents that talked about some of the features that they wanted to see in the textbooks and in the digital platforms that really helped their kids as they tried to navigate how to read a chapter. So that kind of collaboration has been very valuable. Also, we have a rubric that we use when we judge and try to evaluate those materials because there are a lot of materials. Mr. McClendon has been very helpful this year. He's helped us kind of ramp up, up that inclusion and equity piece in looking at differentiation uh, as well as some of those uh, student-friendly features and how closely that the materials are aligned to standards. Also, as part of curriculum adoption, we have a building review. We have committee discussion that takes place throughout the process, looking at costs, and we have a very fair all-teacher vote. After the materials are selected, teachers on the committee provide leadership for compiling the pacing guides, the syllabi aligned to the standards, and these standards, as you know, are required for us to address by law as part of state statute so that we can ensure that all of our boys and girls have the framework for content uh, that they need. The next piece that we've included, now that we have our content adopted, we need to make sure that that instruction piece is, is where it needs to be. And so the content is provided, we have a pacing guide, we all need to make sure we're working within this framework, but now we need our teachers to bring the expertise, the experience, and the passion to that content. And so we're working within many grants, we're working within other kinds of funding streams, as well as our uh, general fund, to look at what kind of programs can we bring to improve our delivery model. So the first one that you see here with uh, Mrs. Bailey and, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Bailey and Mrs. McCleary, our Career Ladders Grant. We're very fortunate to have a train-the-trainer model in our schools to provide that on-the-ground level support that we need for technology integration and the building leadership. Also, we put on our slide uh, the Google Productivity Tools training that has taken place with uh, Mr. Doug Miller has helped us with the purchase of our Chromebooks to avail us of much training with Google products. Uh, this has been at no cost to us besides the purchase of the Chromebooks. We have a lot of training that, that we're very, very grateful for. We've also included our digital classroom that Janet Grosmer has been uh, tremendous this year to provide leadership for, to help teachers engage in what are the components in a digital cl classroom that we need to uh, make sure that everyone understands and that we're using consistently in our classrooms. Also, we work with two title grants that provide professional development. Uh, John Newport, Caitlin Lieberman help us with STEM training as well as our Canvas training in K-2 this year. Also, we've been very fortunate with our grants to provide, as well as our general fund. Uh, Mrs. Pease works with our Canvas liaisons who have done an amazing job this year. It's Nathan Simpson, Jennifer Norris, uh, Bill Payton, and Chris Davies. Those teacher leaders have provided a very proactive stance for us this year as we work to roll out Canvas. They have uh, really looked ahead to give us guidance that we need. 
Also, we have two other grants that we've had committees work on uh, and written to the state. We have a digital learning grant, a community advisory grant, $50,000, and then another one of $100,000 that are helping us in the area if we have our content in place in terms of our curriculum adoption, our print materials, our digital platforms. What are we doing to make sure that that content is delivered in the very best way? And so we're working with a technology vendor to provide training for eight awesome strategies. So we're looking at what, does, what kind of strategies do we need to provide teachers training with to bring this content to life in classrooms. And so you see up here the eight that we're working with, we've had training with all year. And then we're also looking at micro-credentialing our teacher leaders so that they have a deeper uh, dive into these different awesome eight strategies and then they can transfer that learning to our teachers in buildings who then transfer that to students in buildings. And as an example, this second one, or even the first one I could go into a little bit of a discussion about collaboration. You know, instead of saying, okay boys and girls, I want us to get in groups today. What they taught us in terms of thinking more intentionally about strategies let's build those groups with what we want the outcome to be. So let's think of a little bit more about the roles that we want our students to play. And let's be really transparent in those roles. So let's give descriptions of those roles. So you know, we, may, we may want Mrs. Wise to be the encourager, and we may want Dr. Powers to be the facilitator, and we may want Mrs. Killian to be the strategy analyst. So they have roles to play. And then we change these up as the year goes around so that our students learn what it feels like to take on a new role in a group. And it builds communication skills, those soft skills that they're going to need later on. So we're really pleased with that and um, want to move forward with more micro-credentialing when we can. This next slide gives you a little bit of background with what the digital platforms look like. And as we see in this uh, further slide, some of those experiences with our content that we already have adopted, you see four here. And we're going to ask Dr. Caitlin Lieberman, our grant, Christy mentioned uh, the work that she's done with Title I. She also helps us with our grants and enrichment, as well as providing leadership in our summer program. And so she's going to provide a little variety tonight and come to us from a digital stance. With a focus on curriculum adoption, digital learning platforms are a key component for both our students and our teachers. Students access digital learning experiences throughout the traditional academic year, while our teachers have support to engage in professional development throughout the lifetime of the adoption, or six years. With that, let's transition and take a look at Connected, a platform for Wonders 2020 Everyday Math, Social Studies, and Health, as well as a sneak peek of the opportunities our students will have this coming summer. With that, we'll start with Wonders 2020. We're going to take a look from the perspective of the teacher's platform. Every teacher has access to both a teacher and a student edition. With that, we take a look here at Wonders 2020. Students have access to an abundance of resources. And for our purposes, I do want to highlight our resources tab specifically. Here you can see that our students have access to 120 level readers, as well as 645 games. Oh my, so many choices for our students to select from. With that, we truly focus on that differentiated learning component, and our students have access to all of the print resources that are in the classroom to utilize those on their Chromebooks as well as at home. With the mention of home, if we take a look at the school to home piece, we're really focusing in on our parent involvement and engagement. A way for our families to see, here's what we're working on this week in the classroom, and here's how you can provide support to your student. With that, we'll take a look at our everyday math as well. Again, we'll visit the student perspective. With this, students have 
access to the specific lesson. If I click on this option that we have available, you'll see from start to finish, from our mental math and fluency math message, all the way to our math boxes and our homework. Again, that family engagement piece, focusing in on providing support to our students. So with that, students have access to a multitude of resources. With that, I will share some additional opportunities for exploration, including my ebooks. So again, those prime resources that we have in the classroom are available in the Chromebooks, as well as at home, along with the e-toolkit, tutorial videos, and playing games online. With the e-toolkit, my goodness, we have access to those hands-on, tangible materials we see in the classroom. By selecting the e-tools, students have access to a multitude of resources. You can see here the everyday math card decks, counters, dice, dominoes, fact triangles, fraction circles, money, and more. All of the things our students enjoy and manipulating with each and everything in the classroom available once again for them to access on the digital platform. With that, with our EM games online, again, the differentiated learning is embedded within. Our students can access ongoing level resources as well as a skill builder and challenge. Again, we can include our family members and choose to do a multiplayer option in the EM games. With that, if we return back to our Connect Ed platform, we also have access to our social studies and our health platforms. However, I do want to take the opportunity to share a sneak peek of our summer learning opportunities. We'll transition into Beast Academy for our grades three to five students. As you can see here, we're going to start with our comprehensive curriculum. We'll then transition into engaging practice. As you can see here, 15 thousand problems, as well as challenging puzzles available within the puzzle lab, along with online guidebooks. So those books that our students are highly interested in are available to provide support as they work through the instructional components of Beast Academy Online. There are also 700 instructional videos for students to access as well, along with detailed reporting for our teachers. Now, for our grades K-2 students, we're going to take a look at Big Flicks, and here is a peek as to what the platform would look like for our students. Again, a digital platform with 150 plus fiction and non-fiction parent texts for our students to access throughout the duration of the summer. We also have for our grades 3 to 5 students a focus with close reading, which is embedded within our Wonders 2020 program, and it's a focus for us as we acquire our literacy skills. So with this program, you'll we'll see we start out with reading it, we transition to analyze it, and then we discuss it, along with a round of game review. We also have an optional audio support embedded in, which is something we also see in the Wonders 2020 platform as well as everyday math. So we have support for our students for all levels and focusing in on that differentiated learning component. to our English language learners. English language learners that you see in the chart, we have uh, proficiency levels of anywhere from 1.0 to 4.9 based on a WIDA assessment. We have 155 students that we currently serve that are considered limited English proficient students, and then another 36 that were just recently um, in the past two years, they're on monitoring for two years that brings our total student population of current um, students at 191 English language learners. To identify our English language learners, the very first thing we look at is the home language survey. Upon enrollment um, for any student, when they're enrolled in kindergarten or um, in our state for the very first time, they're given a home language survey. On that home language survey, parents are asked three questions. What is the native language of the student? What language is spoken most often by the student? And what language is spoken by the student in the home? Based on what 
or the answers to those um, three questions. If an answer other than English is given, we then move to um, looking at what their English proficiency score is with a WIDA screener. So including English in the Beagle County School Corporation, we have 24 different languages represented and taking away English as the most, um, the language most often spoken, we have 98 Spanish speakers, 10 Vietnamese, 9 Arabic, and 7 Mandarin as the top four languages in our district. So um, when you have the home language survey, we're given, um, when they first enroll, we go out to the school and administer the WIDA screener to all students kindergarten through 12th grade. Kindergarten has their separate, um, it's given one-on-one, -on -one, and first grade through 12th grade is all an online assessment, but it is given by a trained WIDA administrator. We are able to use um, NESP, the non-English speaking grant, which is a state grant to fund our test administrators. And then every year, Indiana's testing window begins in January, goes through February and March, and we give the WIDA annual assessment. And so that annual assessment takes our limited English proficient students and gives them the student, or the grade level that they have. And we're looking to see what their proficiency score is. Any student that is above a 5.0, they're considered a fluent English proficient student and then we're monitored for two years. So now we're going to look at how we're going to help support those students. So we, professional development is a big part of the grant through our Title III. So we heard about Title I, Title II, Title IV. Now Title III, which is that federal grant program. And then also through NESP, which are state funds. We have opportunities to um, work with our teachers in training with WIDA workshops, there's a sheltered instruction observation protocol workshop that we have 43 teachers that are SIAF trained. And this summer, we in spring, we hope to have two classes of 15 each for those, um, for that certification in SIAF. That only strengthens the um, ability of those teachers and what they're doing with their English language learners. We also, um, have TESOL certification, and that with Indiana State University, we have one stu um, teacher that is TESOL certified. She actually works as a consultant with us in training the rest of our teachers. We have four that they have the coursework completed and they're waiting for their licensure test. Six are currently working on their TESOL certification, and then we have an additional eight teachers that are interested in receiving that um, TESOL certification through Indiana State. Can I stop you for a moment? Mm -hmm. I know what TESOL is, but I don't know what WIDA is, and I don't know what SIOP is. Okay, so SIOP, so we'll start with WIDA. WIDA is, it really doesn't stand for anything. Those are the standards that English language learners use for, um, and I'll go back to the first one. When, when we give that WIDA test, so what their proficiency level is, so a very, very beginning English speaker is going to be in that um, entering stage, then moving as they're more proficient in English, they're in beginning, developing, and expanding. So we're looking for that fluent proficiency of English. So WIDA standards are what are adopted through the state of Indiana and um, we use those to guide our instruction. So um, SIOP is just a model of, um, that teachers can use to um, gauge their learning, to gauge their instruction so that they meet the needs of all students, English language learners in particular, but it's also just good teaching to help bring those students up with um, their English proficiency. Thank you, you're very welcome. So when we have our English um, language learners, what are we, you know, really looking at what we do with our, for our students. So using those Title III and NESP funds, we help to support the teacher and what they're doing in the classroom. That teacher is that very first primary teacher for our students 
that um, are not proficient in English. We also provide um, educational assistance with our general fund and they're really working at an individualized learning plan. So what do those students, so students that are identified with special education have an individualized education plan. We have an individualized learning plan for our EL students. We are able to provide, um, through these grants, materials to help with differentiation and intervention. We work with the parents. And then also we have specified English as a new language class at Terre Haute South as we have you know, students new to our country that are very, um, that entering stage at 1.0, that they can work um, on more proficiency with their language. Now we're gonna to move to a little bit about state and local assessments. Under the leadership of the assessment committee, which is a BCTA approved committee, uh, and in conjunction with the Beagle County Strategic Plan, Beagle County School Corporation Strategic Plan, the school district has implemented formative assessments that complement both uh, the Indiana Summative Assessments as well as our district curriculum initiatives. To kind of give you a quick snapshot of our district assessments here. Our Indiana Summative Assessments, they're on the left side of your screen. Uh, we start in I with Ivory 3. Uh, with reading standards for all third grade students. And then our iLearn assessment is given to all students in grades three through eight in English and language arts and math. It is a computer adaptive test which adapts each question to the, the learner as well as it has a, uh, performance task questions which are uh, more uh, writing prompts and uh, short answer. We have science in grades four and six, social studies in grade five, and biology at the high school level that all fall under the iLearn umbrella. The biology is uh, in compliance with ESSA requirements for uh, the federal, um, uh, for federal ESSA. Also at the high school level, we have our ISTEP grade 10, which is in its last year of accountability for the school district. Next year, we'll move into the SAT test, which will be accountability for grade, all grade uh, students in grade 11. For our formative assessments that we have as a district, we have our uh, Acadians Learning Online. This is a, an assessment given to grades K1 and 2 in reading. It helps us start identifying those reading gaps for our young learners. And uh, Dr. Fenton referenced this assessment earlier, uh, which is, is formerly known as DIBBLES. Uh, and so the DIBBLES has become Cadence, and so this is, has been utilized for many of our data projects for uh, K1 and 2. We have our math benchmarks, which are given on Google Forms on the Chromebooks this year, uh, which have been around for many years and have given us a very uh, standardized uh, assessment for, as far as a, a standard level of uh, data points for our district for grades K through eight. Clear Sight is in English language arts and math for grades three through eight. Clear Sight is the same vendor as I Learn, And so it has a look, feel, um, everything about how our students are, interact with it is, is almost identical to the I Learn assessment. So they, they are able to utilize the same kind of technology enhanced questions for drag and drop. Um, and for the writing prompts, uh, to be able to experience that writing prompt in an on online environment. It is also computer adaptive, so each student's uh, assessment is individual to them, and it also has the performance tasks. We have other form of assessments, such as the reading inventory, our BCSC writing prompts, um, and some other district-wide assessments. Janet mentioned uh, WIDA, uh, our dyslexia screener, which is the um, Acadians Online Learning, our first grade GT potential screening, and also the PSAT is given to all 10th graders. So when we look at our assessments and how we use some of that data, I'm gonna focus a little bit on iLearn. iLearn is our assessment that uh, affects most of our schools for accountability. And, um, and so this is an example of an iLearn report. This is a, an individual student report and is shared with all parents via the Skyward Family Access starting this year. The last time we gave iLearn was in 2019. And at that time, we used to uh, send the reports home with our students in a paper envelope. Uh, but now we're going to be able to uh, put, the, put the reports on Skyward Family Access, and parents will have access to these uh, reports continuously throughout their students' career within the Beaver High School Corporation uh, for the long term. So now uh, uh, that report that gets taken home gets put on the kitchen counter that no one knows what ever happens to it. It will always be accessible to our parents from here on out. Uh, the scale score 
is given there with the little bar graph there with the, the red, yellow, green, and blue. So this student had a scale score of uh, 5607, and they kind of see throughout the whole scale where they fell. The, the blue, uh, or I'm sorry, the red area is uh, below proficiency, and then in the yellow, they're approaching proficiency, and then there's the cut score, and then green is a, a proficient, and then blue is above proficiency. So the students are able to be, uh, are put into uh, kind of four different grading areas there. Uh, they're also able to see how their student fared against the whole state of Indiana with an average scale score there at the bottom, the corporation's average uh, scale score, and then uh, the school's average scale score. The report has a page two that kind of takes this, the parents into a little bit more deeper dive into the data with their um, by standard. This is a, an example of a, a language arts, so it has key ideas and, and textual support there for the first one. And that little bar graph to the right there uh, kind of shows the, the green is the, the average range for where that student was falling, and then kind of the, the black areas where there are within that, uh, that standard. And so uh, they're either at or near the standard there uh, off to the right, and then the, the next standard down in the bottom one there, the right and there above standard uh, comparatively with uh, other students of uh, same age. Uh, teachers can access these reports in multiple ways. They can access them the same way that, uh, parents do through Skyward, or they can also access it through the Indiana Assessment Portal. Um, if they, when they do go into the Indiana Assessment Portal, they're also able to download it as a spreadsheet. And so uh, teachers are able to take that spreadsheet, and this is an example of a spreadsheet that has been divided up into uh, three different areas. The, scale, the uh, students were ranked in the classroom by scale score, and then they're able, able to put their students into three categories. They're represented by each color, and then those categories would then uh, allow for intervention and remediation, as well as enrichment uh, with those students in groups uh, during the IE time throughout the day. Just a kind of a, a little comparison of, um, that was how we look at our summative assessments, looking at our formative assessments, looking at ClearSight, you'll see that it's a very similar uh, report. This report also, uh, this year, was uh, sent to parents through the Skyward Family Access uh, just in January, and was able to give the students, uh, uh, the parents, a kind of a snapshot of uh, where their uh, student fell uh, at that point in the year. It's an interim assessment with ClearSight that's given twice per year, once in September, and once in January. And like I learned, it assesses the students over the whole year's worth of standards. And so that gives us an opportunity to get a baseline at the end of the year in the fall. And then in the middle of the year, we were able to show growth and uh, see where students are growing and where we need to make a little bit more impact prior to the final summer of assessment coming up uh, uh, in with I Learn. Um, it's uh, the individual student, uh, student report also puts uh, four different categories there for where the student will fall. So this student fell just above uh, the uh, category. And remember, while they're just a little bit above passing there, this assessment was given in January. So that's a pretty uh, good indication of where that student is on track for uh, their academic year. Uh, teachers can also, so this is available to parents. Teachers can also access this report. Uh, teachers can, just like with uh, iLearn, they can download it as a uh, spreadsheet, and then we're able to sort the spreadsheet by scale score, and you can see there's a below proficient, approaching proficient, proficient, highly proficient category, so that we can continue with intervention by standard uh, with groups of students. Um, an added benefit to ClearSight is the longitudinal report. This is a report that tracks the student's progress in each subject area over years instead of just within that one school year. So each one of these dots uh, follows this student from their first assessment in 2018, and then, their, uh, and then they tested again in January 2019, and then on through each assessment uh, up until last fall. And so as a mathematical snapshot, you can see there was a huge jump of growth there from uh, fall to January, the first time they take, took it. And then the next school year, they dropped a little bit, which is okay, but then it went back up. But here's the important one. From last year to this year, they remained stagnant. In their, uh, in their data, in their trend. And that's how we can help look for learning loss. And uh, in this case, the student, if you look at the next uh, standard there to the right, the expressions and, ex uh, uh, expressions and equations, uh, that student showed a pretty significant amount of learning loss. And then uh, this does not show the next uh, assessment, which was done just more recently in January, which we hope there would have been a significant jump back up. 
Um, so it kind of allows us to see an overall snapshot of each student. You can also look at your class as a whole and how they're tracking within the data. And then uh, we can, at the district level, look at the district grade level um, as well. Uh, professional development takes place each year uh, with uh, these different forms of uh, data and uh, different forms of reports to help coach teachers and how to find their data, manipulate it, and analyze it. We do it in more of a, uh, a, a live work session kind of session where we, we have them go log in and look at their data and follow along with us as we look at uh, district data and kind of go through it. And so kind of to kind of wrap up, a little bit how we're using this data to look at learning loss and how we're impacting learning loss. Uh, clear sight, uh, we're able to look at it uh, very uh, detailed in a detailed manner by standard in English language arts and math in grade three through eight. Um, <clears throat> we've uh, also been able to utilize our math benchmarks in kindergarten through eight. These have been a consistent data point for many years, but what's been uh, very interesting is we were able to look at the, just this past January and, and this last fall, and we were able to kind of pinpoint uh, specific standards and then develop, uh, with mathematics anyway, specific lessons with our elementary math liaisons that can be utilized during uh, outside the math time, like for example in the morning when students are kind of wrapping up their breakfast and, and getting ready to transition to school day, the teachers have pre-prepared math lessons for them that are directly tied to our district learning loss areas of standards that have been the, the most uh, impacted. And later on, Frank will be able to kind of get, dive into that a little bit deeper um, but this is just kind of a little bit of a teaser uh, for that. And so I'll just uh, pause there before I pass on to Holly and see if you have any questions. And I forgot to... Thank you. My focus is going to be our um, extended learning enrichment opportunities, which happen outside of the school day. So real exciting to be a part of those opportunities. Um, in our first slide,
Okay, we're going to start back here uh, with enrichment and extended learning opportunities. Uh, these are opportunities for our students to participate in activities and enrichment uh, projects outside of the school day. So this could be before school, after school, summer school, uh, just a number of opportunities. And with that, we're going to start with academic competitions. As you can see, there's quite a list of academic competitions that our students can participate in, from the elementary, middle, to the high school. Uh, I, I wanted to point out three in particular, uh, one being our fifth and sixth grade math contest. That is a local contest uh, that is hosted at Honey Creek Middle School. It uh, has been for several years now. We did amend that contest this year just a bit. Uh, had students take uh, their tests at individual buildings, scored those tests, and then still distributed trophies and ribbons throughout the district. Uh, fifth and sixth grade students at each of our schools, elementary and middle, do participate in that contest. I then wanted to point out Geography Quiz Bowl. That is an opportunity for our middle school students to participate in a contest with a focus on geography and a particular part of the, uh, in the, of the world. Um, and it is sponsored by Kiwanis Club. Our local Kiwanis Club has sponsored that competition well, since the early 90s. And, and the reason I wanted to point that one out is that is an example of our community uh, coming together with the school corporation and supporting an academic competition. And so that is one uh, at the middle level. And then junior and senior academic Super Bowl. I mention this because this represents students that participate in all content areas on teams and it is a statewide competition. So schools uh, across the state participate, and there is a middle level and a high school level uh, where students can um, participate on those teams. That will be virtual this year um, in May. Our next slide uh, represents our 21st Century Community Learning Center's grant. Uh, this is our after school learning opportunity uh, that takes place throughout the district. And at this time, I would like to recognize Kathy Deal. Kathy, if you would please stand. She is out in the audience. Uh, Kathy uh, is our site coordinator for 21st Century and helps coordinate community partners and activities throughout the district and we appreciate what she does for that program. This is a program that helps strengthen the quality of instruction during after school program time. As you know, we have after school programs throughout the district. Uh, this particular program helps support a few of those after school programs with a grant teacher that works alongside our local um, Vigo County Y to uh, help promote not only the academic piece, but also the community partner piece. And I've listed several of our community partners there that we work with and that Kathy helps coordinate. Uh, in particular, one that stands out to me this year in the last several years is Purdue Extension of Vigo County. And so I did want to recognize them. So that, once again, the academic piece as well as the community partner and recreational piece are all very important. 
The next piece I'd like to highlight um, is specific enrichment pieces. This would have to do with our community field trips. We have field trips. We normally would have field trips other than this year that focus on a particular part of our community and our state uh, at the various grade levels. Um, in addition to field trips, we also have community partners, once again, that help support initiatives that really help strengthen the curriculum and the instructional program that students find K through 12. Here on this list, I would like to highlight a couple of initiatives that have been supported the last several years. Uh, one just recently happened virtually, and that is Human Rights Day at Indiana State University. Traditionally, we would bus our high school students there, those that, are, that belong to specific clubs in support of human rights, or those that have a particular interest um, in that area. But uh, this year, it was presented virtually, and our high school students participated, and, and it went on very well. Another one, um, the mock trial event um, has been supported by a group of local attorneys here in Vigo County. Uh, they really spearheaded this a couple of years ago and really targeted the middle school level in having our students learn about the legal system. We have bus students to the courthouse for this event and they're actually trained with our local attorneys during the school day and then participate in a mock trial outside during a field trip experience. So this, once again, is weaved throughout the curriculum instruction work plan, but takes place outside of the school day. Right in front of you um, at your chair, I placed the VCSE Character Trade Roadmap. This, to me, really speaks of the so social emotional learning piece that's also embedded throughout our curriculum. Um, our, we have a, a common language focus that's really been promoted through our Project AWARE grant. Um, in particular, uh, our health standards and our social study standards very much highlight social emotional learning, but you can also find it in our district writing activities on this character roadmap, which uh, is presented in each of our school buildings through our banners and our signage. And then our coordinated efforts with our counseling programs and our mental health organizations throughout the county. So, uh, very much um, social emotional learning is weaved throughout our curriculum. Well, Frank and I are um, really pleased to be here tonight to discuss with you the work that our writing and math liaisons do. The writing team consists of five veteran teachers, and they provide a 50-minute lesson to um, every one of our elementary schools, uh, second and fifth grade. Uh, over 900 second graders and over 1,000 fifth graders on a weekly basis get that lesson. And so this year, they've had to change it up a little bit because they've had to uh, learn how to uh, present their lessons both in the classroom and remotely as well. Their uh, weekly writing lessons are taught by the team are focused on the Indiana academic standards. The goal of the program, of course, is to increase student knowledge of the writing traits, specific writing skills, and to help our students become proficient writers. The presentation of the lessons have been re redesigned this year due to having to service students in the classroom and virtually. Google Slides have been utilized and, for weekly lessons and shared with the teachers. I kind of wanted to focus on the I learn part of um, the writing team because every uh, a few weeks before the fifth graders participate in the I, I, I learn test, the writing teachers design lessons to prepare those students to be successful on the writing portion of the test. Expectations are outlined and the scoring rubric, rubrics are shared with the students. Uh, they show examples of previous props that have been uh, used and give explanations to why those uh, writings received the specific score that they did. So, a, a real key component of the writing team is their professional development. Um, they provide professional development to classroom teachers, not only the second and fifth grade classroom teachers that they visit on a weekly basis, 
but the K through five teachers in that, in the buildings that they go to. Uh, the writing teacher and the classroom teacher utilize a co-teaching model of instruction during the lesson. So the writing teacher will model various stages of the writing process, and then the classroom teacher can use what has been modeled to carry out during their own writing lessons. And throughout the year, the writing teacher provides many writing resources to the classroom teachers. This year, of course, has brought on new challenges for the writing teachers, and that part of their uh, instruction this year has been to provide tech technology integration within all classrooms during faculty meetings, after school grade level meetings, and just individual help to teachers that find them when they're in their buildings. So they've given it assistance with the implementation of Pear Deck, Nearpod, Google Suite components, and many other apps and extensions. The writing teachers are very involved with several community uh, activities on an annual basis. They hand out books and provide a student writing activity during the Family Learning Day that's sponsored by the Vigo County Public Library. And that was a virtual uh, event this year that they participated in. They have a table set up at the Literacy Fair that's sponsored by the Wabash Valley Council of the Indiana Literacy Association. But I think the one activity that they really uh, like to do each year is our annual second grade writing contest on diversity. And so they work in conjunction with the Terre Haute Human Relations Commission and their director, um, Jordan Lowe. Uh, and Matt McC McClendon has joined that this year too and helped out with that. So they, every second grader in the corporation gets to participate in this contest. Uh, the lesson always has a literature connection that explains the meaning of diversity. Uh, this year the book was titled All Are Welcomed Here. So it discusses how diversity is present in the classroom that welcomes everyone throughout the entire school day. A uh, winner is chosen from each class classroom, including the two remote classrooms that we had, and Mrs. Lowe and Mr. McClendon are in the process of visiting each of those elementary schools to, uh, to award the winners with their uh, a medallion that the Human Relations Commission has. So I want to take this opportunity just to share one of the winning entries with you. So I think you'll be amazed that this came from a second grader, so it kind of showcases what our writing teachers do. So this is called, What is Diversity? Diversity is something different from other things. There are many forms of diversity, like gender, weight, height, age, race, religion, and virtually anything. It gives our lives variety. It affects how a person lives in society. An example of diversity is my school. My friends enjoy soccer, basketball, dancing, or singing. Everybody has a different variety of skills and knowledge. My interest in chess started after I saw some friends play it. Another example is music. Different instruments make different sounds. When all the different instruments work together, the music sounds wonderful. Diversity works well for our health, too. A well-balanced diet leads to better health. We see diversity in nature. There are different animals. Diversity is colorful. Together, our differences make a strong, beautiful, and creative community. Pretty impressive for a, a second grader. So oh, that just wow. gives you a little bit of um, what they do on an annual basis. So um, I appreciate you letting us have this opportunity to share about our fabulous writing team and our inspiring young writers. So Frank Bailey's going to talk about the math team. So very much like um, the writing team, the elementary math team, uh, impacts um, students on a daily basis. Uh, it's composed of a team of three veteran elementary teachers. Um, they visit 202 K-5 classrooms um, in 13 Title I buildings. Um, this year has been a little bit different because we've been in an in-person um, virtual combo format. Uh, and we visited those classrooms in a, a, on a three-week uh, rotation. Uh, typically, that's a five-week rotation, but the pandemic has brought all kinds of surprises that we've been able to adapt to. Um, so as the district math coach, one of the most rewarding parts of my work on the curriculum team is with this elementary 
uh, math uh, team. Uh, if I look at If, we, if I look at the work we do, it's really three big categories until uh, the pandemic arrived, and we added a, a fourth to that. We have two screens. <laughs> uh, and, and so the first um, uh, bit of work we do is really connected this year, particularly uh, very connected to the, the fourth uh, point on the slide. Uh, so if we look at the work we do, we have these data-driven, uh, standard-based lessons that we create. And we use formative and assessment data to uh, devise, to plan, to um, address the needs that students uh, have, uh, have brought with them. We design these um, lessons with specific standards in mind. We use literature, interactive activities, EM games including digital versions and even at-home activities. So I can show you some of that data. And this is a fifth grade example from a recent benchmark assessment. And so what I did was took a screenshot of each of the, uh, of one section of, uh, of the questions, uh, of the data from there. And we see in this first example, uh, most students, 90% of the students, and there were 938 who uh, took this benchmark assessment, answered it correctly. So when we start looking at data, we try to find out where maybe tiny adjustments in understanding content and process may need to be made. So the second example, if you get us there, maybe. Well, the second example, um, there is a, there we go, let's use the keyboard. Um, the correct answer is really the, the yellow portion of this pie graph. Uh, and if we look at what the question was, we can look very quickly to see that students don't understand the idea of parentheses. So we're able to make small adjustments, and in this case, build uh, some lessons around that Indiana academic standard, which happens to be a, a priority one standard. A standard meaning uh, a, a priority one standard is tested uh, frequently on the iLearn Assessment. So it's an expectation the state of Indiana has for our fifth grade students. The second big part of the work we do on the math team is that embedded professional development we do for teachers. So when we go into the classroom, we're teaching standard, uh, standard based lessons, but we're also teaching teachers. Uh, and part of that is using the everyday math content, the text, the manipulatives, the digital resources, the games, how that is an integral part of every lesson that is in the math, everyday math curriculum. We also model the use, particularly this year, of technology integration. So this year brought Chromebooks, apps and extensions, and other add-ons that we integrate into our lessons, but also provide that knowledge to teachers too. So we guide and assist teachers with their data analysis, much in the same way that I showed in point one. So we help teachers look very intently at their own classroom, the students in their classroom to find the needs that they may have. It might be a little bit unique, uh, looking at 20 students rather than 1,000 students. And then the third part is our after-school professional development that we provide to teachers. So we model the use of grade level data analysis. So here's a fourth grade example. And in this example, each benchmark assessment we give, K to two, three per year, three to eight, uh, two per year, teachers re receive feedback, particularly about uh, the standards that were assessed, um, how uh, their students scored, and then what that correct answer is. So again, with that data analysis, they're able to pinpoint specific misunderstandings and address those needs. So this is color-coded. The green portions show students who um, need help with that particular standard. Uh, we see what the standard is. We see what uh, the question was. So again, we guide teachers through that embedded staff development to help them understand uh, the data uh, their students 
of the students in their classroom. And here is an example of uh, one of those after school uh, professional development opportunities that we provided to uh, teachers. It was virtual format. Most of them uh, of our professional development opportunities have been in person until this year. Uh, but we provided Nearpod, Jamboard, and Pear Deck uh, professional development. We use those apps and extensions in our digital lessons whenever we present to uh, students and teachers in their schools. And then lastly, uh, COVID learning loss, uh, very much connected to the first point on this slide. We were faced with what do we do with the situation we are now in. So how do we address that learning loss? So we looked at cohort data comparing, for instance, third grade students last year to uh, them as fourth graders. So compared student to student. And we can see the learning loss based on this particular benchmark. And so it's broken down by grade level. And so we can see this difference. If we're looking at this row, this is student to student, same groups of students over the course of one grade level to the next. So we can see that there is learning loss. We can look very particularly at what the highest missed standards were. We built some resources around this data to help our students and teachers as they prepare for any upcoming assessments, as they prepare for any misunderstandings or any content knowledge that might have been lost. And here is an example of a second grade uh, resource. So we developed uh, six sets, um, K to five, of um, very targeted, standard-based um, resources for students to work on with their teachers. And it was really designed to be in a discussion format, uh, not to be assigned and then collected and, and not addressed after that. So second grade is a very typical standard, uh, even more so this year is telling time. Um, so designed as bell ringers or um, the transitional between uh, uh, subjects would be after or before lunch. Examples like this. So we are addressing those needs that the benchmark highlighted as a high need for second graders. So uh, this is week one of grade two. There are five more sets that focus on other targeted standards as identified by the benchmark. And so each day teachers and students would have the opportunity to just very much um, focus on their energy on that one topic. Really dig down into that content and understanding of what that content uh, is, what is expected from that content. And then the last thing connected to COVID learning loss were jumpstart lessons that we created at the beginning of the year. Here's a third great example of that. So there were some things that happened at the end of last school year when the governor closed schools. We had remote learning. We had opportunities for students to work at home. We had this time where uh, there were some very important priority standards that were necessary for students to understand before they moved to the next grade level. So those prerequisite standards, we wanted to make sure that students knew, that teachers understood uh, how important they were uh, to the continuity of the Everyday Math program, to the curriculum, to the pacing guide. So these uh, lessons were jumpstart lessons. So teachers started the year with these lessons at the beginning, um, the first 10 days, uh, and we provided them with the resources from the previous grade level. And so all of these uh, items together were a very uh, specific targeted focus for us as we prepared our students for the learning loss, uh, as we prepared them for the grade level in which they were uh, entering, and um, as the year rolled out, we continued to look at how we can continue to support 
students and teachers uh, throughout the math curriculum. Thank you for your time. Really well done by each of you. Um, a lot of um, work to try and keep the students up to the grade level and to help those who have sort of fallen behind a little bit. And uh, you've done an awful lot of programs that you're initiating, I think, as well as um, following through with. So thank you for sharing. Does anybody have a question or other comment? I just like to as a former student, many of the things that Holly talked about brought up wonderful memories for me. I think I did a performing arts workshop every year I could. I was in many of those academic competitions, so I know how valuable those are. Thanks for keeping that going. I'm, I did Model United Nations in high school, and I absolutely loved it. I know that we don't do that, but it was just something that was super fun, and we even went to the national contest. Linda Lambert. Okay. And I took my students to uh, court with the attorney. Doug, I hit my 12 hour day mark, and I had an 11 and a half one on Saturday. And so I'm going to bang it out and no front to you. I hit my wall. I'm sorry, everybody. All right. Thanks for being here. Thanks for helping us get the uh, shots in the building. And do it. Yeah, that's great. And Mr. Dillion, you're up. I'm going to, I'm going to stand if that's okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Hayworth for picking out this snazzy jacket tonight, and I'd like to, I'm not going to mention her name, but there's a young lady back in the room that uh, told me um, I could go for 45 minutes if I'd like. Uh, she's wearing black, so if I go too long, it's her fault. I think she left. Um, no, she's, she's waving right there. Uh, I do want to mention my team. Um, Karen McDonald's the newest to my team. Um, she's been with me less than a year. Chrissy Brown's been with me over 13 years. And Diane Gaskin, over in the Adult Learning Center, has been with me over 11 years. Whoops. Let's go the right direction. Um, I'm going to talk about four basic areas. The first area I want to talk about is adult education. Most people don't realize this, but our adult education program serves over 400 adults every year. And that's been consistent for the last five years. In 2019-20, we had 116 earn their high school equivalency. We average right around $350,000 a year with our adult basic education grade. And this program is totally grant funded and has been for about the last 10 to 12 years. Um, we started working that way 12 years ago. It's probably been 10 years ago since we've gotten there. Um, we have 54 partner-funded scholarships to help kids take the HSE. So adult basic education classes are free. The HSE costs money. Those um, partner-funded, um, Scholarships go from the Education Foundation to Altrusa to our newest one, Dollar General. Um, so they range all over the place. Um, of course, we have several different services. Um, I'm disappointed to say our longest running community education class, which Jackie Lauer was a member of, the woodworking class, which had continuously ran since 1963, COVID derailed our street. And I was devastated. And I had old people calling me upset, or very senior people upset <laughs> that I canceled class. Um, and, and, and I had no choice. So um, ruin that street. So we're going to have to start a new street with a class. Um, most people don't realize that there are a lot of collaborative courses or collaborative workspaces with adult education. And I want to name a few of them. The Men's Jail, Women's Jail, Terre Haute Library, West Terre Haute Library, the Terre Haute Housing Authority. We have two sites, 
Lighthouse Mission, Advix, Union Hospital, Horsburgh and Multiple Vigo County School Corporation buildings, the YMCA, which offers free childcare, and in the past we've been places like ISU. Um, we went there for a special series. So we will go anywhere in the community that people need their adult basic education degree. One of the cool things with COVID, if there is a cool thing, is it forced us to work hard on our virtual um, side. Um, we have a lot of 16 and 17 year olds that venture into adult basic education, and um, we've been better able to service them. Um, another cool thing is our CDLB course, which is commercial driver's license, um, a lot of people that go through that become bus drivers for our school district, which is pretty cool. Um, so we keep them right here in house. And last about adult ed, I want to remind you of May 12th at 6 p.m. at Woodrow Wilson is adult ed graduation. Now I want to talk about music. Music's the newest one to our office. Um, one of the neat things, you guys have continued to invest in music, and that's a big deal because a lot of school corporations have cut music and cut music programs. And here's what I mean. We, in K through five, we continue to have music at least once per week in the schools. In six through eight, and this is a big deal, we have band, orchestra, choir, and general music. Those choices. And music meets every other day, and it rotates with physical education. So every other day, kids get music at the middle school. That is huge, that does not happen in a lot of places in the state. And then in high school, we have uh, several opportunities, as you can see. One of the things that turned out kind of cool that's still going on right now is um, Terrell Symphony Orchestra, the um, Education Foundation, has always helped fund a field trip. Well, obviously, we couldn't go this year. So last week, they played a virtual concert. And, and you think, well, kids watch a virtual concert. Yeah, kind of cool. Well, this week's been the cool part. The kids are able to sign on, and we've got different musicians from that concert who slotted with different times with different classes, and the kids get to talk to the musicians that played in the concert and ask them questions. And today, it was so cool watching the little kids, and fourth and fifth graders got to participate since last year. Of course, COVID messed up last year's fourth graders. But watching those kids and the crazy questions they ask, it, it, is, it was just really, really neat. And that's going to be going on the rest of this week. And lastly, I want to thank you for the $500,000 investment in the music instruments. And, and I want to remind you, our work's not done there because we do need to work on facilities because humidity, temperature control is our enemy at the high schools and we do have a space issue related to music. Now I want to talk about the bread and butter um, of um, what I was hired to work on, career and technical education. Our school district offers 31 different career pathways Probably the coolest pathway, in my opinion, is automation and robotics, and that's because we're the school district that invented that per pathway. We got a quarter million dollar grant from a governor after working six years trying to get the state to do it. We finally got a governor that was friendly, gave us a quarter of a million dollars. We started the pathway, and within six months of us starting the pathway, it was so popular that they made it a standard pathway statewide. Now it's all over the place, at the post-secondary level and the secondary level. And it's being split off with next level programs of study into two pathways. So that started right here with our teachers' hard work, which is really, really cool. Um, in 1920, we awarded in CT 3,607 college credits. In 1890, 403 state recognized industry certifications. Last year it was a little bit messed up. We were down 50%. Um, it just was a rough end of the year. That's when we do all the testing. Um, typically, in a given year, 
we bring in a total between 2.2 and 2.6 million dollars in career and technical education with all the different grants. Um, but that's not the big story. Again, this is a testament to you guys. It's the middle school feeder program. If you go around the state, most places have eliminated that middle school feeder program of business, family, consumer science, engineering, technology, and we have preparing for college and careers, and Superintendent Hayworth's got some cool ideas that we're looking toward the future of adding in there that I'm really excited about. But that's been because when times got really tight, the board did not say, hey, we're going to just get rid of this, we're going to get rid of music, we're going to get rid of career technical education at the middle school. You did, you stuck with it, and we're better off for it. We do have 72 teachers currently in career and technology, career technical education, which I thought was a cool fact. Extended services. A lot of people don't realize we have a lot of extended services in our office. Um, probably one of the newer ones um, that was also created here in our school district is the NEAT trailer. It stands for New and Emerging Automation Technology. Our best year, we've seen over 9,000 kids. And when I say kids, kids are adults also. Um, and I say that because we've set up a Pacer Games, the State Museum. We travel for the Indiana Department of Workforce Development. Now we go see every fourth grader and every seventh grader in our school district. And we mainly do our traveling in the summertime. We have several cool partnerships. Um, for example, the construction camp is um, a partnership with the Carpenters Union. It's not even on our grounds. It happens at the Carpenters Training Facility. Um, and then we have, um, we do several special projects to benefit the community. Um, one of my favorites, the Terrell Children's Museum. Um, the next slide, I've got a little um, thing for um, you visual learners. Uh, but I do want to mention on partnerships, career and technical student organizations. Okay, so clubs for CTE. This will give you an idea of partnerships. First Robotics, our major partner, Rose Holman Institute of Technology. They meet out at Rose. DECA, which is the marketing student organization. ISU is a major, major partner of that group. HOSA, which is our health career student organization. AHEC is a major partner of them. Those kids don't even have to pay to go to state competition. They're such a big partner. FFA, brand new. Sarah Solutions and Culver's Restaurant have stepped up huge time for the new FFA. Super Mileage, the Education Foundation, Duke Energy, and Vectran have been partners of those forever. Just to give you a little idea. Now, I want to end with a little round robin for you visual people. Let's see if we can do this well. I'm going to tell you where these took place. Just to give you an idea of community partnerships. Up in that corner, that's where we live. Rose Park, Hamilton Center. That's a partnership with USAC. United States Auto Club. That is actually at a national quarter midget race. That is actually at Indiana State University. No, I did not visit the cadaver lab, but the kids did. I would have passed out. Right up there at the top corner, that is actually out front of Novellus at their 60 year anniversary. The Novellus employees went through there. That is actually at the county fair. That's out Laverne Gibson. That is at the Carpenters Union, students in class. That is in Atlanta, Georgia. That's DECA. That's America's best community. Our kids built that float. It's all themed around career pathways. Um, Frontier Communications sponsored. Super Mileage Team Sonoma, California. Vex Robotics uh, Competition at the County Fair. Tech Town USA at Home Expo. That's just a really neat project the kids made for uh, principals one time. It's tape dispenser. Those are two welding students laughing at um, the pipe fitters that were having the same problems with stick welding sticks um, that were too dry. And last but not least, right in the middle is John Newport and Lucy testing out our custom-made from scratch excavator 
that um, we built the N24 feet that are, is at the construction exhibit. Last but not least, I have two handouts and there's extras for anybody in the crowd that wants them that tells a little bit about adult ed and career and technical education. I would gladly take questions. Did the other little girl in that little picture, did you get her dad's permission? <laughs> no. My, my daughter's in the picture with John Newton. <laughs> your, your daughter's in that picture also? Yeah. <laughs> oh, she's using the digger? The digger, yeah. Well, actually, those were easy to build compared to the, the excavator thing. Did I make you nervous there for a second? <laughs> <laughs> and you lose Rob, I'm under. 7,000 uh, in your board docs. I would encourage you to uh, go in and review those. The policies that really were identified and we have yet to meet with our consultant were a drone policy. That's 7440-03 small unmanned aircraft systems. What we want to look into is we know that the drones fly over our football fields, and we want to just make sure that that's a legal practice. Second policy that we looked at, 7540-02, uh, uh, that's web content apps and services and policies to address app use by staff and students and ADA accessibility. So we'll be reviewing that one. The last two kind of went together. 7540-1, uh, which is really just a technology piece. It's guest access. And once you have guest access, what are your limited rights to that guest access? Uh, followed closely by uh, policy 7542, access to corporation technology resources for personal communication devices. Log in and what kind of security uh, do we use to guard that? And Doug could probably speak to that. And then lastly, uh, 7542, electronic data processing uh, and uh, recovery in case of a disaster. And in our student records, uh, as a result of that conversation, we know they're protected. Our financial records, we know that they are protected. Uh, but we have to check on a few other items. 
that's what the group came up with. If you have any other questions in regards to Section 7000, please let us know. This would serve as our second reading. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next meeting scheduled is Monday, April the 26th as our business meeting. Um, are there any comments from the board? Any other comments, Dr. Hayward? It's a great job for uh, curriculum yes. instruction tonight. Yes, it was very, very impressive. I hope that... Um, and when I walk by, they're usually all sleeping. I, don't know what they're doing I hope those at home were able to um, understand to, to hear it. Yeah, I had just a couple people texting me that were watching, and they were just literally blown away by everything that passes across the desk. So Good. I think that's the case. It is very impressive. Yes. Thank you all for presenting, and thank you, board, for being here. And we'll see you again on the 26th, if not before. Thank you very much. Meeting.